This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms. How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, top of the publishing day to all of you. I always like to think Author Publishing Day um, and to just remind all of you how powerful the your words are, that they really do matter what you get out there, what you promote, what you support, what you market. And today is all about marketing tools. In fact, one of the big ones that popped up um, over this past year when the pandemic hit was something called Zoom. Now, so, a lot of us were using Zoom. Um, certainly in my field, in consulting, in book coaching and the like, we've been using tools like Zoom and Skype and other online uh, related things, working with clients when we are working globally as well as locally. Well, now we've all been thrown into it, and I thought it was appropriate really to do a program about Zoom and how some really some tips, tricks, strategies things that you can do become more efficient because I'm hoping you as an author, you're reaching out to do book clubs with Zoom, with connecting with fans and followers, to doing book launches, to doing, you know, a a whole blown Zoom-a-thon. And with that is Paul Griffin. Paul is a, uh, he has been involved in hosting hundreds and hundreds literally, of webinars, online meetings, uh, working with people like you for virtual workshops. And now you're going to be able to reap the benefits of his knowledge and tips. So if you've ever hosted a webinar, thought about it. If you're doing online meetings or teleseminars, you know that there are a lot of things that can create hiccups and there are factors that can make or break how you professionally come across So Paul is here to share those tips so you don't fall into the potholes and to make sure that your next online meeting that you're the star of or you are hosting goes smoothly. So Paul, welcome to all of you, your guide to book publishing. Oh, I love that. Okay, so here's where we're going to go. I I guess... Maybe we should redefine how many people are using online right now to to uh, support their expertise. You have any idea how many users are out here? Million at any one time just on that platform alone. So it's, it's it's really blown up, as I'm sure a lot of people have heard, in the past year to where you literally can't go a day without either being involved in or hearing about a virtual meeting. And that's critical to know. <laughs> how do we how do we stay out of that trouble? Or I mean, or how do we bring it all together um, with what we're we're going to make us look better? You know, and, and one of my disclaimers, everyone, my unplugged events. Um, that are being held on the last weekend, the Friday, Saturday of January, February, March. Paul will be my Zoomerator. He will be working with me so I can be on communicating directly with everybody there. And I don't have to worry that you can't figure out where your mic is or any of that because Paul will be handling all those behind the scenes, which is kind of a godsend for me. So, all right. So we have millions of people out here on Zoom, on Skype, on what are some of the other services that are out there? Do you, oh, do you Lord, know some of those? Uh, Zoom, Skype, GoToMeeting, WebEx, 
Microsoft Teams is a newer one that they've come out with, mm -hmm. um, Skype for Business. There's Zoom Rooms, which is a, a corporate integration with conference rooms and cameras. There's so many of them that it's hard to pick out every one. Those are just the big players and more popping up every single day. It's hard to keep up with the dozens of services that there are because everyone has seen the need and the huge demand for it. And so everyone's trying to get it on the ground floor or well, not on the ground floor anymore, but <laughs> in with what's popular and what's going and what's going to make them money. Mm -hmm. So with that, that's, I think Zoom is the big granddaddy right now. Would that be safe to say? They kind of I think own so. the space. Zoom is, the special thing about Zoom is that they came into it at the perfect time. The only service they've ever offered from the get-go um, has been virtual or online meeting rooms of some kind. So they've really streamlined it to where some of the older players can't quite compete because Zoom is just, this is all they do. And they came into it with modern technology. So they've really maximized the benefits of just pinpointing a need and really developing on that solely. You know, I think you've said something really important. Th this is what their game is. This is what they do. And so as a company, their objective should j only be to get better, where you've got a lot of people thinking, oh, oh, you know, we maybe we can do this and let's hop on, but they don't have all the bells and whistles that the Zoom boys have. Th that's what I'm going to guess. Would that be correct? Exactly. There are a lot of companies that do online meetings, but not as well with as much functionality and with, with as much reach as Zoom. All right. So let's talk about how to use Zoom. How do people do? They just go zoom.com to check it out? Yeah. Is that well, it's, uh, they go to their website, zoom.us, and ah. you have a few options that you can do. You can either get the app for your phone, iPad, or tablet. You can download the application directly to your computer, or if you're just joining a Zoom meeting, you can even join straight from the computer browser. So you mm -hmm. start out at zoom.us, click on the download, um, or at the bottom of the screen, you'll find the download links, find what fits your computer operating system, create an account, and then download it and log in. All right, so I'm I'm just going to ask, uh, since I do a lot of Zoom meetings, I have regular classes I do on Zoom. If I'm going to see hiccups or problems, it's not coming from the people who are logging in on their computers. It's from some of the other apps. Is this a fantasy of mine, or have you experienced any of that? It is not a fantasy, actually. Uh -huh. I think the reason why that I've experienced is the the interface on the computer is very straightforward. You see everything at once, and it's a lot easier to navigate. The mobile versions on the iPad and iPhone specifically, when you log in, some of the controls disappear, and you have to tap the screen to bring them back up or swipe left or right to see other functions or click on the ellipses button, the three dots, to bring up more commands. So everything with the nature of the phone and the iPad since it's got a smaller screen, everything isn't always present immediately. So it's a different interface, and people are so used to logging on the computer. When they get to the phone for the first time or the first several times, they're confused because they don't know where to go because it's not in the place that it normally is. Okay, that, that's a fabulous tip. And, you know, I was really thinking, you know, maybe they're they're just inept because, I mean, I've had so many problems and I finally have said to people, would you just get on your computer? Just get on your computer because this is a workshop. You We are interactive here. Um, and I hotspot everyone all the time. All right, so we've got that. Now, is it free? They do have a free level. So... The biggest limitations with the free level is, um, well, let's talk about the benefits because it's always good mm -hmm. with starting with positive. If you have a free account, you can have one-on-one -on -one meetings for up to 30 hours. No one should ever go that long, but that's what the maximum is for any <laughs> Zoom meeting that you do. Oh, my God. Um, We're going to do a filibuster. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but the limitation for the time limit is you only get 40 minutes if it's a group of three or more people. And this is not a 40 minute warning or a buzzer. It literally shows you a timer 
and shuts you off in 40 minutes. So whether you're finished or not, you're gone. Mm -hmm. So that's the benefit of going with, and with any of these platforms, you always want to go with some form of paid if it's within your budget. Usually it's around $15 to $20 a month just for the entry level. And with Zoom specifically, you get so much more now than you did originally because ever since their demand started increasing and they had so many more users, they started hitting the free accounts with maybe you won't get HD quality video. Maybe you won't get as much bandwidth as the paid people do. You know, you don't get as much as you used to with free because they can no longer afford the computer uh, necessary, the necessary computer requirements to service everyone at the same level. So they start shunting more toward the paid users. So definitely go with the paid minimum version just to give you the peace of mind that you're going to have at least something that's stable that will do what you want it to do consistently. All right. So let's just say, I mean, we have about 90 seconds before we take a break here, but let's just say, Paul, that we are um, checking in ourselves and, and going on and um, – with you know, with that, Ed, it, it, that we're looking, okay, so which paid option do I take? So let's assume we don't have discounts. So it starts at what amount up to a full blown? Can you do that in like in forty five seconds, real quick? Because <laughs> I was talking. Yes, the um, I I can try. I'll, I'll go as quickly. So with ah. the very basic Zoom meeting version, if you pay it monthly, it's fourteen ninety nine a month. That gives you up to a hundred participants group meetings for up to 30 hours, the ability to stream live on social media like Facebook and YouTube, and one gigabyte of recording space. Okay, I'm going to have you hold else. that. Okay, Paul, I'm going to have okay. you hold that because it, it, we're going to go into the, the quick break. So when we come back, we're going to talk about the, fa the paid variables so you understand what you're jumping on and what would be most likely best for you. And then we are going to go into some ahas on tips. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Is there a book in you? Or another? Author You shows you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being hoodwinked. If you already have a book out, you will find a supportive and brainstorming community that is connected and creative, no matter where you live. Author You brings in national experts for its book camps and annual Author You Extravaganza. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author You's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publishing. Author U is the premier authoring resource in the country, creating community, education, guidance, vision, and success for the serious author. If you want to create a book that has pizzazz, punch, and panache, Author U is for you. Timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted on its social media platforms, and it is free. Discover Author U, where authors go to become seriously successful. Join Author U today at AuthorU.org. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. We're Zooming today, talking about the tips and tricks, strategies, tactics to use. With us is Paul Griffin, who has been working with people like me, um, authors, and showing them how to really be much more efficient in productivity, really productivity-wise. 
um, using Zoom and which could lead to lots more book sales, which I think all of you would love. So we were just talking about some of the basics. We've gone at the 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 We've gone past free, so, so we just kissed the paid at the first level, which is, um, and then we're not assuming, uh, we're not going to be talking about discounts because different organizations have different discounts. So I'm not going to go down that path. But if you're a member of any organization, you might want to reach out to the administrator and say, do they have any benefits with Zoom for members? That, I think that's reasonable to do, Paul, would you say? Agreed. Any or any professional organization yeah. or any college or university. Yes, exactly. Yeah, education is always big. All right. So with that, we were at the opening level where it was fourteen ninety nine. You can get up to a hundred people into it if you want to talk for thirty hours. <laughs> by golly, you can do it. You can stream onto Facebook and where else can we stream? Facebook and YouTube right now. And YouTube. Okay, so you've got those players in, in play. All right, what's next? Well, and one other item I do think it's important to oh. mention, you can stream to Facebook and YouTube Live natively through Zoom. You can stream to multiple social media platforms through other services. And if you just do a search for social media streaming through Zoom, you'll get a big list. Um, so going on from... The, the pro account, which is the $14.99, the entry level uh, uh, tier, for them, you start off with 100 participants in the gigabyte of storage. Then you can add a la carte options to that. If you want a little more storage, you can pay $40 a month to get, uh, I think, 10 gigabytes of storage. If you want to add more participants, you can add a large meeting add-on. So all of these options are a la carte on top of the $14.99, depending on what fits best for you. Then that is up to nine licenses. Then when you get 10 plus, you get into the business plan, and that is $19.99 a month. Then you get everything that you get with the pro, plus some specific business features. And all of this is, if you go to zoom.us slash pricing, it lists everything out on what each tier and it's typical tier pricing of basic, you get this, pro, you get that, plus this, business, et cetera. Perfect. All right. So, everyone, you've got that uh, website, zoom.us forward slash pricing, and you can start seeing what's the right fit for you. Remember, it's it's for you what you're going to do and push forward. All right. So, let's let this do a jump here. I'm One of the things, the big aha Paul that, uh, Paul, that I picked up from you was when you said, before you start a Zoom meeting, restart your computer. How come? Why would we do this? Well, well if, um, <laughs> if, if, if anyone that's had, especially a PC for any length of time, you know that after a while it starts running slow, applications are sluggish to load, even web browsers, and especially the memory hogs like Chrome and Word and Adobe, so every time you open a program on your computer, it takes up a little bit of system resources like memory or RAM space, hard drive space, everything. When you close it, part of that resource assignment gets reserved. It's called resident memory. So these applications mm -hmm. remain in resident memory, which is taking up system resources. Not a big deal if you have one or two small applications, but once you've had a week of opening and closing applications left and right, a lot of your system resources are taken up, which can lead to video lag, streaming errors, crashing programs, the blue screen of death is what they call it, the rainbow wheel on the Mac. So the best, the best thing that you can do for yourself, anytime you're using something that is going to take up system resources, especially if it's professionally streamed, is restart your computer. That pretty much takes it into a brand new state, wipes the memory clean, everything is good to go. So when you start up your application to stream live to the world, you're at the best possible position you can be with that system that you're on. Well, that seems like common sense. I, I don't think we all think about that, though, you know, because we all, we have multiple tabs open at once. We live within it. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> so, For most people, computers are magical things that just yeah. do what we tell them to do and we don't think much about it. 
I know, I know. All right, so we got that. We're remembering. Okay, so let's talk about what what would be our next step. So we've restarted it. We're going to have a Zoom meeting with with the the Fantasy Book Club in Omaha. All right. So what should I be doing? Well, the most important part of any Zoom meeting or any online meeting is practicing and testing. If you are going to be by yourself, log in by yourself, screen t- log in the second on your iPad or your phone or another computer, and try recording, try broadcasting, try sharing your slides if you're doing it. If you are presenting with someone else, have them log in and do a test call. I don't care if you've done 100 200. I have a client that I work with normally, Patricia, she's done over a thousand and we still have with me and we still have Mm -hmm. a practice every single time because we always want to make sure that everything is what it's supposed to be. So you make sure that you're at the computer you're going to be for the live presentation. Your co-presenter is at their computer they're going to be. Everything is exactly representative of what it's going to be when you live stream and that way you kick all of any possible errors away completely. Well, most of them anyway, because there's mm-hmm. always something that can happen. The internet goes out, there's a storm, what have you. But that puts you in the best possible place to have a seamless live presentation because you already know that all the factors that are present for the live, you're practicing in advance. So to mm-hmm. me, that is the most important step after restarting your computer. Well, and I and I also think there's a in this practice thing that I, I know I always try to go. I'm going to tell everyone I always try to go on early to make sure. Um, I number one I have my lights on. You know the lights that I use behind my laptop um, that'll be coming at me. Do I need more light? Do I need to change it? I I I want to see what it looks like, and you need to see how you look too. I mean truly. Um, and, and then I'll add on one other thing. You've got to see what's going on behind you. I actually was on a Zoom meeting by a professional speaker that one of her worker bees behind her had a bed unmade, Paul. Oh, no. Yeah. So we don't oh, want that, just... people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, <No>. we... <laughs> we, we don't want that. So what's behind you? What's behind you? Um, and and I would love to have you, Paul. I mean, we didn't actually have that on our on our list of things, but I would love to have you to talk about backdrops. One of my bugaboos is that I see a lot of people on Zoom, and if they move one a quarter of an inch, all of a sudden they start disappearing. On on oh, that, it just looks so bad. Yeah, it does it look, everyone, it, it does look bad. It makes you so, look unprofessional, and it drives me insane. And what mm-hmm. causes it is when people use, and it's a, it's a wonderful feature to use, especially, you know, with personal calls and what have you. But if you have a virtual background and you're going to use that in the Zoom system, you have to have a green screen if you want to look as good as you possibly can. Because what the green screen does is, it gives the camera something to pick out. So it knows it's this weird color that doesn't appear anywhere, typically in nature or in clothing. So it can say, okay, this specific color needs to be filtered out, and this is only where the background goes. When it doesn't have the green screen to pick from, it's a guessing game. So as the light shifts, as, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever, it's trying to pick you out, but it just can't do it without the green screen, so you end up disappearing. If you're an author, of course, that's the, the, the group we're talking to. If you hold up your book, a lot of the time people can't see your book because the colors are shifting. And if you're an author promoting your book on a virtual meeting and they can't see your book, this kind of defeats the purpose. So any kind of green screen you can get, whether it's an expensive pop-up mobile version or even a chroma key green sheet that's tacked up on the wall with no wrinkles. It has to be smooth and well lit, but it doesn't have to be special. It can just be some color. If you want to paint a wall behind you in in your office or studio, you can do that too. As long as it's the right color that can be picked out, it doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to be there and be the proper color. 
Oh my God. I can't imagine having a wall painted that green color in my office. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We digress. So, um, and although I like green, I mean, I love lime green. I love that apple green. It's what it's in my corporate colors, but it's a different green. So I, I, what Paul has just said, I have seen this so many times with authors holding up their books and half of the book shows, or it fades, it wiggles, it has ghosts, it has all kinds of things. So for talking about um, an investment, um, uh, the, the one of the things I'll recommend for all of you, there's something called the web around, and you have to put the in it, the web around. And it's a it's a green screen. It's it's square and it's circle. Um, it can fit on the back of your chair. It's got these things that you can do it, and uh, that might be one thing to to use. So the web around. But Paul, you probably have some others. And then what I'd love to have you kiss on. We have less than two minutes before our next break. I'd love to have you kiss on. Um, so what do you use if you're going to use something? I mean, I actually like to see natural. I like to see kind of where people hang out and, and what they do, but they better be neat. They You can't have piles of paper. You you, you can't have the bed unmade in the back. Uh, you can't, at least I don't think you can. You, can you comment on that? Yes. Uh, you want it to be as unbusy as possible. You know, you don't want a pack of papers. You don't want your luggage. You don't want your unmade bed. You want something neutral, even if it's just, a palette of pastel colors behind you or, you know, a plain looking image of an office. Zoom has a wonderful library of images that you can use built into the system. You want to avoid the ones that move because anything that distracts attention is distracting away from your message and what you're trying to present. You don't want that. So something neutral, an office, a modern looking, even clean, you know, living room in, the, in a house, anything that is kind of neutral that doesn't take focus or attention away from you is always the best in my opinion you know being an author have a shelf of books behind you or have a blown mm -hmm. up picture of the cover of your book on an easel that blocks that everything else just something that like I said doesn't take too much focus from you that is neat and tidy behind you so if you if you have it set up in your office and you're setting that up and you do have that easel like a blow up a foam board of your cover or maybe several of your books, that will work. But the lighting better be right. We're going to take one more break here with us is Paul Griffin and we are talking Zoom today. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Discover the power of you and your book at the Judith Bryles Unplugged events. Each summer, Judith Bryles Book Marketing Unplugged unfolds over three intensive days working with just Judith. You get publishing strategies, author and book platforms, book marketing panache and pizzazz, and authoring tools to take you and your book to rock star success. In the fall and winter, Judith Bryles Speaking Unplugged includes Judith as your coach and mentor during two powerful days. You will learn how to structure a speech, how to create openings and closings, how to find gigs that pay you and sell your books, and you will get one-on-one -on -one coaching. Go to thebookshepherd.com and click on the Events tab to learn how to participate at the next Unplugged Workshop event. Congratulations on getting your book published. The effort you put into your work is truly commendable. But what's next? What will happen to all the knowledge you have worked so hard to acquire to produce your book? Here at TogiNet Radio, we can provide you a platform to keep your knowledge working for you through the power of podcast. The subjects our podcasts cover are as varied as the grains of sand on a beach. From life coaching, to military resources, to business success, even to the paranormal. We have a place for everyone. To get started on your next step, call Scott at 903-787-5880 or email him at scott at 
toginetradio.com. That's S C O T T at T O G I N E T R A D I O dot com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All righty. So Paul and I have gone through the free versus the fee. We Paul has said absolutely you know, you got to clear the memory, restart your computer, get the tabs down, shut down all this other stuff. Um, I loved his idea, you know, do a practice test call. I think I think it's really important to see, you know, just do quietly. Get on 15 minutes before you're starting to see how you look. Do you, you know, do, do you look okay? Do you need to, to, whether you need for women, do you need a little bit more lipstick? You, you're on camera, everybody. And one thing that I've learned on being on TV is you need makeup. So put a little makeup on to take the shine off or anything like that. A little bit more than what you might normally um, do. So, Paul, let's, what about some of the, you had on things that you want to talk about. Uh, some of the technology best practices. So what are some of those that we could uh, bring to the attention of everybody? As far as technology is concerned, the minimal, what you want to do minimally is have an external microphone and have an external camera. The built-in camera on your laptop is great. The microphone's fine. It's adequate. But to really uh, look minimally professional have the external mic so people can clearly hear you and have an external camera because the internal camera is never going to be as clear or as versatile as far as where you can move it as an external camera. So, you know, even if Logitech C920, we're talking maybe a hundred bucks and that's a decent entry level one. The blue, the blue Yeti microphone is, is again around a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars And even if it's a stretch, do something that's external that's not built in because it, it makes a world of difference of the quality of audio and video that you broadcast. Mm-hmm. All right. And anything else in the technology line? I mean, I think the mic is essential. Yeah. I think the mic is essential. The, the, the cornerstone of any successful online meeting is having enough bandwidth, having enough internet speed. And people don't, no one's really thought about it much before him, because before the pandemic, because as long as you can stream Netflix and get Hulu or download or, you know, stream music, no one's really cared. And that takes, that doesn't take a huge amount of internet speed. Mm-hmm. I always suggest call your internet provider or look at your bill or your online account, find out what you're using. A lot of the entry level speeds are 50 megabits per second, which is just fine if you're doing casual streaming. I always suggest at least 150 megabits per second. It's not, you're not, you don't absolutely have to have it. It's not what Zoom says is the minimum, but from my experience, that will give you the least amount of trouble. If, if you know, if there's an over taxation on the network, everyone gets home at 6 p.m., you're trying to have your meeting, your entire neighborhood's watching a movie on TV, you're going to have a lag in speed. And the lower the speed, the more of a lag you're going to have. So having that 150 megabits per second is going to help tremendously with a successful meeting. And you can even test what you have now by going to a speed testing service like speedtest.net. And then you just click that go button. It will tell you what your average upload and download speed is right that second. That is only based on the network traffic as it is right then. So you will possibly get a different result different times of the day. If it's less than... 50, I would say. If it's less than 30 to 50 while you're using the internet, you need to call and increase it because nothing looks more unprofessional than when your video freezes or when you get knocked off. Video meetings are becoming so prevalent now where a Mm -hmm. year ago, people forgave a lot more than they do now because a video meeting was something new, was something special, was something out of the ordinary. Now it's an everyday occurrence. So if you lag or what have you, they're going to think that you, your setup isn't adequate because 
most people have a, a decent setup to be able to have that continuous video stream these days. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, the other thing is, I think that if you're going to do a speed test, if, if there are certain times of the day that you know you're going to be doing Zoom, um, for, for example, book clubs could be sometimes they're morning, sometimes they're afternoon, sometimes they're evening. I'm just going to use that as an example. I think that you should be doing speed tests. As you said, they could vary during the day, but there might be a heavier traffic time. I know we used to say that, especially when Zoom started up for all, when the schools went back, it was like, oh my God, there's too many people on <laughs> at this time. Um, <laughs> Because we saw an impact. So I think it's a good idea to do some of the speedtest.net, everyone. Check out where you are. Do it a couple of times during the day to see if there's any variable um, to just see where you are. That would be my two bits on, on that. All right. Anything else on the technology side that we should know about? Um, nothing that I haven't already covered um, and that I can cover in the time that we have, you know, make sure that, oh, one other item, if you are working from home, which a lot of us are, and mm -hmm. especially authors, if you're doing a virtual meeting, if you're streaming, make sure that your family or anyone else in the household preferably isn't using the internet at the same time. Try to do a hardwired connection to an Ethernet cable if you can, because that's the strongest signal. If, you, if there's no way to avoid doing Wi-Fi, make sure that someone's not streaming Netflix or other streaming services specifically because they default to the highest quality unless you change the settings. So when, you know, Timmy's watching a movie on the TV downstairs, that's sucking a lot of your internet bandwidth away from what you need for your business call. So make sure that no one else is using it. Make sure that everything that is on your computer that uses internet bandwidth is closed, even if it's Outlook. Outlook, when it check, checks for mail, if you have a big attachment coming in, that's using up bandwidth too. So anything that's using bandwidth, Adobe Creative Cloud, OneDrive, Google Drive, anything that you can turn off, turn off. You know, I don't think a lot of people, Paul, think about the amount of bandwidth um, email. And especially if there's large transfers coming in of any sort can totally offset and make your um, your connection wobbly, let's say, on that. So I would be careful there. Just my thought <laughs> on this whole Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. So... Um, all right. So I have one of the things that I wanted um, to to go over is the whole deal of um, of etiquette. That's that's one of my button pushers. I mean, we talked about the unmade bed, but there's a whole bunch of other things I think people need to be tuned into. And I bet you you have with the gazillions of Zoom meetings that you have moderated and been on, you probably have a laundry list. Yes. All right, let's hit it. My, <laughs> my biggest pet peeve, and I know it's one of yours, is cross-talking. There is nothing more disrespectful to someone who's presenting or trying to deliver their message than talking over them, whether it's to another attendee, whether it's trying to interject your question. The only person that should ever interrupt anyone presenting is their moderator or their host or their MC, someone that whose job is to do so, because that really, it, it affects their train of thought. Most professional speakers can pick up right where they left off, but you've lost your, some momentum there. You've, you've distracted the audience. Cross-talking is my, the biggest one. Secondarily, just not muting your audio when you're attending a presentation. A lot of people don't realize that the second they connect to audio, Microphones are so sensitive these days, they can pick up a leaf blower outside, a dog barking across the street, your husband whispering something to you in the background, you muttering about your computer. All of this can be picked up very easily by even an inexpensive microphone, and it really is incredibly annoying to the attendees, to the person presenting, and you have to remember, if the host doesn't do it for you, be a conscientious person who's going to these meetings. Mute yourself on audio. 
And if you have to move around, if you have to eat, if you have to do something, talk to someone off to the side, mute your video. You always have that option in Zoom um, in the meeting function. The webinar does it automatically because you're just in a listen-only mode. But you want to make sure that you're not distracting away from the person giving the presentation. Or if you're the one presenting, you want to make sure you're not distracting from the person you've invited to give presentations because that really affects how the message is delivered. So those are the biggest items on my list as far as Mm -hmm. etiquette is concerned. And, you know, you just, like I said, nothing to distract away from the person who the purpose of the meeting is for. That's, that's the biggest thing for me. Yeah. I, I, I mean, those, all those things are on my list. I, I have been on programs and I think this, this taps into your uh, lack of awareness almost but if if you are on like i'd like i stay you can see how your face comes across you you can see your picture are you someone who sits way back like you're in a cave um or are you in um i mean yeah i can hear you giggling almost paul because we see this all the time um or are you someone who really comes forward and interacting and one of the things that i learned years and years ago because i was doing a lot of remote stuff um, on TV is that you learn to talk to the camera. So where's the camera, everybody? Well, if you're using the laptop and using that camera, it's going to be in the middle of like the border at the top of your laptop. So talk to it. Um, and a lot of times I see people will let their eyes wander down because the, the, maybe there's a group, Paul, and the, whoever is talking, it's it's highlighted on the Zoom gallery thing. And they're looking down at that. And then they're responding back to that lower corner, not realizing they need to respond to the camera, especially if you're hosting. Exactly. Anytime you're talking to an audience, even if it feels unnatural, you have to train yourself to look at the camera. If you have notes that you're on, that are on paper, sticky notes or what have you, put them somehow at eye level with the camera so you can still read them and look at the audience and remember at all times when you're in one of these meetings whether you're presenting or not if you're not actively speaking you're on camera it is very easy to forget especially if there's a large group and you're looking at a certain view you your video may disappear and you can't see yourself anymore try to train yourself to keep an eye on the light that's on the camera to as long as that's on, you want to be almost frozen, smiling, nod a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. a little bit of interaction is fine, but I have a bad habit of, uh, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, that's okay. We'll come back and kiss on that on our final segment. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Are you confused about publishing options? Do you know which printing option is best for your book? Does your stomach flip when you think about selling books? Or do you feel overwhelmed with what to do about book marketing and publicity? Get the answers and much more. Get them and from someone who knows publishing inside and out from both the traditional and independent sides how to make a successful book. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so. Or you can create a book that looks and feels classy. Build your brand and platform and is a success, a bestseller. It is your choice. You choose. If you want author and publishing success, you want Judith Bryles as your book coach. Sign up for her weekly blogs and easing at thebookshepherd.com. The book shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing, and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and guide to collaborate with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You do not need more problems. You want solutions. 
Dr. Judith Bryles will shepherd you through the maze and chaos. At times, she has had to step in and rescue a book, a book that has been sabotaged by a publisher, by a publishing service provider, and sometimes even by the author. If you want author and book success, connect with her today at thebookshepherd.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book. If you want to be successful as an author. Your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. We're talking about how to succeed in Zooming it or online streaming or creating virtual meetings. Uh, with me is Paul Griffin. His company is Virtual Business Management. Uh, and you can find more about Paul at his website, which is hostmywebinar.com. Hostmywebinar.com. And we were talking about some of the no-nos, that uh, the taboos that both of us have experienced from people who decide in the middle of it to chomp into an apple. We all hear that. <laughs> or they decide to take another call, which, Paul, I've had that happen. So one of the things, your phones, all that stuff should be off on that. I, I get it that sometimes, I mean, I, you can put your phone on silent if you have something that you, you know, you need to be tuned into that you could actually tap back and say, you know, I'm taping, I'll call back in 20 minutes, something like that. Um, and that I think the people don't realize that these mics are sensitive, Paul, that, that, that muttering gets picked up, that grumbling. Uh, I remember when I, when I'm in the studio doing my audio books, that those mics are so sensitive, if your stomach growls, it picks up everything. And we and literally, we have to stop the recording. Because one stomach growl is not what happens. There's always more. <laughs> so we have to stop. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, and then being interrupted. Um, I know that people know when I'm taping in my offices. And, you know, they they can't come in and 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 talk they they can't they actually can't come in the office my inner office if i'm doing any of this but i think you have to set some rules um paul i don't think any of us said anything either you or i really got into the lighting if you're doing that but i think it's a good idea to have a, a really uh, something like that what i call the circle light um and you can get them for anywhere from 30 to 70 bucks on amazon i would make sure you'd have a light and the best skin color, there's usually three, they have a, like a bright white, they have a kind of a bluish light, and they have kind of a pinky, peachy light. You want to click to the peachy light, it's, be, it, it's a better reflection on your face. And have that right behind, if you're using the laptop, right behind, set up behind the screen. So it will have your best coloring on that. Or you can go into what we call those big pillow lights, the cowboy lights, which are a whiter white. And... You know, you might use those for video, but make sure you have decent lighting uh, when you're doing Zoom. That's one of the things that I wanted to add on for the tech. Yes, and also, if you are a man, a mm. lot of men don't think about this, have some powder. I don't yes. care how manly you are. I don't wear makeup, blah, blah, blah. Have some powder because as we get older, our hair starts to go. We have shiny foreheads. Everyone sees it. Deny it all you want to. It's on camera. There's light. It's going to reflect. So have some powder nearby. It took me a while to be okay with it, but even I'm guilty of not using it as much as I should, but I'm not the one that the focus is on most of the time. So have some powder nearby. If you're not sure what to get, ask your wife, girlfriend, sister, mother, aunt, cousin, whatever. <laughs> ask, believe me, there is nothing that will, I won't say that's kind of stereotypical. I apologize. Women will be more than happy to give makeup tips to men because they'll find it hilarious. You can already hear Judith giggling. Yeah. Well, the so, thing I remember, I used to be a regular on a, uh, uh, our Channel 2 uh, TV station for over two years. I did a, a, you know, a part 
um, on it on, and that you always had to have makeup. And I remember being at a doctor's office or something and the anchor of the whole show was there. And we both looked at each other and I said, Ed, is that you? <laughs> because he didn't have any makeup on. And, and, and for those, if, if you want to know for full TV, men are fully made up. They, they, I mean, they, they literally, it's, it's beyond powder. There is stuff. The, and I, I remember one time I was on a show and Walter Matthau, the actor, was also one of the guests. And he he absolutely would not wear any makeup. He's just absolutely not. I won't. And when I saw the redo of the tape, I thought, oh, my God, he looks like he's dying. I mean, he was popped up. It was unbelievable what the camera will exaggerate on you. So. Trust Paul, men have at least some powder to buff you down. So you or buff it up a little bit. So you're not shiny, you're dull. Um, because you're it'll be better for your face and your forehead. Trust me on that. Anyway, all right, that's my two bits there. Uh, and and let's see, the lighting I wanted to talk about, uh, the muttering. Oh, here's the other thing: animals. Barking, it's not just barking dogs. That a lot of people have have cats. Or they, they have critters that get on their uh, desk and things. And all of a sudden you see a feather duster tail go across. If you're the host, you do not want that to happen. I can tolerate it. If for viewers, I can ignore it. But as a guest or someone I'm interviewing, um, all those critters have to be gone. Unless we're doing a feature on pets. That's a different animal. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Paul? Children. They're cute to you, oh, kiddos. but not oh, to your kiddos. audience. If, if they, like, I love kids. kids. I don't love kids in the background of a presentation because they don't know all the time necessarily social cues of when to be quiet or um, if it's a matter of urgency. is actually urgent, so make sure there's something taking care of that in the background, not to lump kids together with pets, but those are the typically the biggest distractions. If you have a doorbell, put a sign on it that says don't ring it, especially if you have a, a ring doorbell or something electronic that makes a lot of different devices make noises, and also make sure that your various digital assistants are on Do Not Disturb, Siri, Google, Alexa, any of those. If you say Do Not Disturb, you can put them on Do Not Disturb. That way, they won't catch a random phrase and think you're calling them and say, I'm sorry, what did you want? And then again, that's a distraction. So those are the biggest ones that I've seen that, that come up in the background. I am so glad you said that. I have been on more calls when Siri pops up. You know, well, the weather today is, and I'm going, whoa, where did that come from? <laughs> so that is funny. All right. So Paul, let's say someone, you're talking to someone on setting up a new deal, what are the kind of questions you wish people would ask that they rarely do? It's not so much a question, but an expectation is mm. what you want to accomplish in the meeting. When, when people come to me and they want to do a virtual meeting and I, I don't really think about what the, qual the, what the application can do because I already know, but they want to, sometimes they want to accomplish tasks that can't be accomplished with the equipment that they're using, sharing slides, changing the camera frame, doing breakout sessions. You need to have an idea of what you want to accomplish in the meeting. Figure that out first. Then you can pick a platform. Then you can get ready for it. And, and so many people don't just think that every platform does everything the same, which is not the case. Everything is not made equal. You know, the call, the, the, options that Zoom has and isn't necessarily in GoToMeeting. GoToMeeting for me is quite limiting for what I want a meeting to do. So if someone is using GoToMeeting and they come to you and they want you, or they come to me and they want me to host a meeting for them and do X, Y, and Z, and I can't do it, we don't find out sometimes until later because they're not thinking about it. So my the, the first step when someone comes to me that a lot of people don't realize I want them to already know what they want to do in the meeting specifically so I can find the best platform to use for them. 
All right, so let's let's figure out. We've got that all done. You mentioned something which we haven't even kissed on, and I think we need to before we end this session. But breakout rooms, you know, I have been on multiple calls and n not seen them use fabulously well. Can you help me out here, or our listeners out? Well, it all goes back to practice. If you're going to do a breakout room. Everyone has, well, most people have multiple devices. You have your phone, your iPad, your computer, sometimes a laptop, mm -hmm. a friend's computer they can bring over. So you want to start up a meeting, have everyone in, and try to test out the break, breakout room. Because Zoom functionality specifically can change from month to month because they have so many updates. So you want to practice it because the Zoom breakout procedure is very, very specific. You can set it beforehand. You can have the system choose it during the live call, but the host can't be in all the breakouts at once. The host can't communicate to all at once. They have to specifically put themselves in a breakout room to talk to the people. And these are important things to know before you go into a meeting. And a lot of people just assume that you're going to be able to broadcast to everyone at once. You can't. So just with it, just with, with any, any other function, you have to make sure that you practice every aspect of what you want to do on a live call to where there are absolutely no surprises and that it's going to go seamlessly and you can look not just that you're struggling along with technology, but you're confident and you're professional and you know what you're doing and that's going to help others believe what you're selling, so to speak, whether it's an idea or a product. So sometimes, you know, even though you can do breakout rooms, maybe you don't need to. Like, and I think what Paul said is if you're the host, you need to know you can't be in every break room, breakout room simultaneously. You're going to have to go one at a time. So if you're going to create a breakout room and create, use that function, which could be fabulous for a workshop, but you've got to have uh, really clear instructions to the group when they're on what they're supposed to do. Because I've been in one and it was equivalent to that you all can't see me, but you would be, you know, like, like thumbing your lower lip figuring, well, I don't know what we do. Do you know what you knew? Nobody knows. And so they just all do their own thing until everyone's called back. So it's interesting. I think we have to help out. Okay. Paul Griffin, he is known. He is, I shouldn't say known as, but he is the virtual business management. His website is hostmywebinar.com. And Paul, thank you so much for being with us on Author You, your guide to book publishing. Well, it was my pleasure. And just remember, in today's virtual world, the quality of your online presentation can make or break your professional image, but even more importantly, your paycheck. Oh, ouch. <laughs> okay, with that, everyone. Happy publishing, happy writing. Remember, your words matter and make a difference. We'll see you next week. Thank you for being a part of your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Each week.